Hey V, Katogenesis here with a tips video for Cyberpunk 2077. There's some aspects of Cyberpunk that aren't shown well or shown at all in the tutorials. So that's what you can expect here and I'll try to be as spoiler free as possible. So here are this many tips I wish I knew when I first started playing Cyberpunk 2077. Is that what you need from me? My trigger finger to zero this lady? The world of Cyberpunk 2077 has a culture of its own, and with that culture comes its own street slang. It took me quite a while to pick these up, but here are a few frequently used terms and some quick definitions for you. Chum or chumba is another word for friend, and can be used in a friendly or demeaning way. The difference as simple as Jackie Wells, your actual friend calling you chum, as opposed to a stranger calling you chum. Delta is to leave or exit. So if someone exclaimed, let's Delta, they're saying, let's get out of here. Nova and Prem, these are two words that are usually positive. If you would normally say something is cool or awesome or neato, you'll hear Nova and Prem a lot more in their place. Zero or flatline both have to do with dying or killing or murdering. So if a fixer is asking you to take out a target, they may be asking you to zero the person in question. And finally, gonk. It's probably going to be the second most used street slang term after chumba because gonk is another word for idiot or dunce. It can have a positive or negative intent behind the word, all dependent on the tone it's being said. When you start a brand new game in Cyberpunk 2077, you get a choice between three life paths, Nomad, Street Kid, and Corpo. These should be treated as just the origin of your character and hold almost no bearing on the main choices and ending of the game. What life paths affect the most while you're playing through will be the first hour or so of the game, right until you meet up with Jackie Wells, and choices in dialogue if your life path can contribute in some way. So life paths do help with role playing your character's origin and stuff like that, but later on leaves a bit to be desired. You can play most of the side content right after your first mission with Jackie and can ignore the heist for a long time if you'd like to power yourself up before taking on the rest of the main story. As a result of this though, you won't have Johnny Silverhand with his clever quips and commentary, nor have him give his thoughts on your side quests. If you do still wish to explore prior though, I strongly recommend seeing Victor first during the Ripper Dock, which is after the rescue, so you can get your first cyberware upgrades, which up your scanner's capabilities, finally give you an ammo amount on your HUD, and allow you to use quick hacks on enemy targets. After the Ripper Dock mission, power level away. I didn't want to get into leveling and character building too far because that could be a separate video. However, something that took a little while, like midway through the game, to figure out was this. Looking at perks further from the center of the perk trees can imply that the maximum level for skills is 20. But there is also a player controlled cap for skills based on that skills base attribute. So say if your technical ability is at 7, your crafting and engineering won't go any higher than 7 until you raise technical ability further. It's weird, I know, but also it helps me explain the next tip. You can respec in the game for 100,000 eddies. Respecking is not cheap and it's not everything it's cracked up to be. The item you're looking for to respec is called the Tabula Irasa. And as far as I know, it's sold by every Ripper Dock. Just when you go into their merchant window, switch from cyberware to trade and you should see it. If you do have the 100,000 eddies to pay for it, you can get it right then and there, but I'd like to read out what it actually does. It says, restores all spent perk points, allowing you to redistribute them. So all this resets is your perk points. Your attributes are set in stone. And skills, well, they have a growth system. So it kind of does make sense that this is as much respecking as we get so far as of the launch. Still, pretty disappointing for the outrageous price. A couple entries back, I was talking about the scanner upgrades. And I would also like to say that at the very least, if you're not using your scanner for hacking, you should at least be using it for detecting loot. And that's easy enough, you can just tap your scanner button and it will reveal loot in front of you. The tip for that in the first mission disappears real quickly and I missed it the first time. That is the least of what your scanner can do. At most, your scanner can be weaponized if you start playing around with offensive quick hacks. For dealing damage, crippling enemies in some way, 
taking over cameras and turrets that you can quick hack from also, or even just creating distractions so you can get in behind them and grapple. Speaking of quick hacks and scanning, T-Bug, the netrunner for your first mission, gives you a side mission right after the rescue, which is just go to a store, pick up a free quick hack called Ping, the most useful way of surveying the field as far as I can tell. It reveals enemies, cameras, turrets, interactables, and most importantly, access points for those bonus euro dollars and crafting materials. So be sure to pick this up before you get too far into the game. Speaking of access points, breaching is kind of required for getting into those access points and getting all those goodies out of them. The breaching system takes a little bit to get used to because a lot of the terms make it sound more awesome and hackery, but also, the new terms make it a little more confusing. So, from the lower left, you've got your code matrix. This is where you input the codes in a crisscross pattern. To the right is the sequences you can input and the rewards. And if you are data mining, the third one is the best, usually. The buffer refers to the amount of code pieces you can put in before you're locked out. And finally, on the top left, you have the timer, which doesn't start until your first input. Because it shows you all of your options and all of your solutions before you even select anything, you can hover over the code pieces to see where they are on the corresponding side. The thing that makes this a puzzle is that you can only select from the row, and then the column, and then the row, and then the column, and it keeps interchanging until you're out of inputs or you solve it. So being able to plot your strategy before the timer starts is what I would suggest the most here. And also, with the sequences, especially when you're trying to get into an access point that gives you all these nice data mine rewards, sometimes the parts in each sequence can overlap. And this one is a prime example. All of these sequences have 1C, 1C. So if I put in 5, 5, 1C, 1C, I'll get data mine 1 and 2 with just three inputs. But I put myself on the wrong side to get the third data reward, so that was forfeit. I'd have to try next time. It'll take a few attempts, but you'll be a hacking master in no time. Conversations in Cyberpunk can hold your character's attention as well as your control's attention. And if somebody addresses V directly who is trying to loot the room and needs to crouch to get underneath and loot something, it can sometimes skip dialogue because the crouch button also skips dialogue. If you're looking to be able to crouch and be in conversation at the same time, I did find the solution to this and it's buried under the gameplay settings, towards the bottom under miscellaneous. The skipping dialogues option can be switched from skip by line to continuous skip, which changes it from tapping to holding. And assuming crouch is toggle for you, it won't skip dialogue whenever you do that. I think it's safe to say that most of the cars in Cyberpunk 2077 kind of handle like butt. At least at launch, they handle poorly. If your next objective is a couple of blocks over or a, about 100, maybe 200 meters away, it might be better to just run rather than accidentally drift into pedestrians or slide past the turn you're supposed to make. Uh, even though the emergency brake helps with some of the turns, it seems like even the tutorial forgets to even tell you the e-brake's a thing. It's whatever your jump button is, by the way. But because of the vastness of Night City, sometimes vehicles are the way to go despite feeling like you're driving in snow all the time. So here are a couple of the best handling ones that I've found. First is just using a motorcycle. I know a lot of Tiger Claws have them parked in their turf, but there's also a particular side quest that comes off of the heist after you're done with that that rewards you with a motorcycle too. Now for cars, while they are fickle, I did land on one that I kept going back to, and it's one you don't have to buy for your character at all. And that would be the Archer Quartz, which has, I think, three public variants and then one variant that you can buy, but don't buy it. The 29,000 Eddie one actually handles the worst out of all four of these variants. Carjacking is the way to go for this one. For the quartz you find out in the streets though, the best part about it is it actually sticks to the pavement. And I'm tempted to even call this the best handling car in the game. The public archer quartz are not the fastest, but they will get you from A to B without feeling like you're on a slip and slide. And they're super common, you'll find them all over the city. Fortunately, stealing cars in Cyberpunk usually comes with pretty little penalty, because if successful, you'll be able to outrun the NCPD anyway. Locked cars can be stolen from parking lots with a proper technical ability, and directly from drivers with a high enough amount of the body attribute. If you don't meet the body or technical ability requirements, you can just shoot the vehicle that has a driver and they'll leave on their own. 
Some missions, like the Cyber Psycho sightings, offer extra rewards if you're able to incapacitate your target instead of eviscerating them. I need to mention though that there is no long-term penalty for going lethal versus non-lethal, but if the gig or mission asks for it, non-lethal will grant you more rewards. That's it though, so even if you incapacitate someone and leave them out in the open instead of shoving them in a freezer or something, enemies who discover the body won't make an effort to see if they're okay, even though they could be with a good night's rest. I hope that gets changed honestly. But that didn't stop me anyway because I do like playing stealth games too. For the missions that do ask for it though, let's go over non-lethal methods. Grappling behind for a non-lethal takedown is an option. Blunt weapons and fists are supposedly always non-lethal. Status effects like fire, poison, and shock, and even bleeding are generally non-lethal, somehow. And you can even make all of your attacks non-lethal regardless of weapon too through cyberware with optics mods, or even weapon mods that make that specific weapon non-lethal. Of course, if you attack an enemy that's already been incapacitated or already on the ground, it will certainly kill them. So any bonus effects that come off of you causing an explosion of some kind or just other explosions in the area can kill an incapacitated enemy. Speaking of explosions, there is uh, some unexpected deaths that happen in Cyberpunk 2077 too, and to answer the question what killed me, it's probably a microwave exploding or something. There is an absurd amount of objects, just scan the room when you, when you go into a room full of enemies next time, and standard armor doesn't seem to reduce the damage that they deal at all, resulting in lots of possible ways to die during a firefight, none of which by the enemy directly. So. Be wary of explosives around you, and mines too. Mines are pretty easy to overlook, but will probably one-shot you. There's a lot of tricks you can do with inventory when it comes to being over-encumbered. This is an RPG after all, collecting things off the ground a lot. You are probably going to become over-encumbered at least once. So first, to increase your carry weight, there are perks and also cyberware that can increase your carrying capacity, either by a set amount or by a percentage. I believe there is armor mods to a lesser degree that increase your carry weight too. But I personally try to avoid using those methods because I want to either save perk points, save mod slots for something more combat oriented, etc. So on to weight mitigation. The, the items that are going to be the heaviest are weapons. Boom, tip done, just kidding. Luckily, there are drop points all over the place where you can sell those weapons then and there. Emptying your pockets and making money at the same time, that's efficiency. But if you are still encumbered and need to get to a drop point, you can either call your vehicle or just jump into a random one and then drive to the nearest drop point or vendor because encumbrance doesn't affect your vehicle, similar to the Witcher 3 tips I did. Roach doesn't know what encumbrance means. If you own the car, you can also access your stash from the trunk if you have some good iconics or equipment you want to use but aren't quite to the level yet. Just another way to lighten your load. Now when it comes to making the eddies. It's a toss up, especially if you're taking on crafting too, which to keep for selling and which to disassemble for crafting purposes. Well, thankfully, there's a couple of guidelines I came up with for such a thing. First of all, the perk that auto disassembles, called Scrapper, don't take this one. There are junk items that are worth up to 750 eddies that would otherwise get automatically broken down to base components that are not near worth as much. The junk items in question are jewelry. Any jewelry will sell for quite a bit. Second thing to sell is weapons. Weapons will sell for the most amount of eddies most consistently from what I've noticed, whereas armor and apparel should be probably broken down more often than not. So sell weapons, disassemble clothing and armor. And before we get too deep into disassembling, if you want to see what components you're getting from gear, there is a way to do that, and that is disassembling from your backpack menu rather than your equipping menus. If you hover over the item when you're in your backpack, you will see on the left side the components that you will gain. But there's one more item category that plays a part, and that is consumables. There is an overwhelming amount of consumables in the game, but roughly half of them can be disassembled into crafting components, and that's what I recommend you do. So every so often, check through your consumables, most of which you're probably never going to eat or drink, and do a quick disassemble pass. When you return to crafting, you'll have the materials you need to make those weapon and armor mods. Armadillo for armor is completely overpowered. Craft yourself some ammo or grenades, items that'll actually be effective at healing you, or even weapons to resell. So making money in crafting is kind of going hand in hand and has a balance if you want to do both.
One of the questions I had that I didn't have an answer to until I reached the end of the game was, is there post-game content and or is there a new game plus? And no on the new game plus, but yes on post-game content, kind of. So after the credits roll, it will give you the option to go back just before the point of no return to do more open world stuff if you see fit. But depending on your ending, you might have additional rewards to play around with after that point like a completion bonus or completion item. I could make a video on that too, but I need to find out what items the game actually gives you because it doesn't explicitly state which items. I know some of them are iconic pieces of gear though. Iconic items are the uniques of Cyberpunk 2077. At a glance, you'll be able to tell whether an item is iconic by its background, which is textured like a circuit board. Iconic items when picked up will also give you a crafting spec to upgrade their rarity, provided you have the perks and materials needed and that piece of gear still. Upgrading the rarity is where you'll get the biggest boost to its damage and adds more effects to the weapon, but also keep in mind that it does reset its mod slots and potentially adds more. The original is still required for upping its rarity, whereas upgrading just ups the stats a bit. You'll probably want to do the increase in rarity first First, and then do the upgrade second because I don't know if the stat raising carries over. It is nice to be able to continue using your unique gear that you'd probably want to use more than your general looted commons and uncommons. If you've got any tips of your own that you've picked up while playing Cyberpunk 2077, please share it down below in the comments. The community aspect is my favorite part and people helping each other out is just wonderful. I like fostering that. If you found this useful, entertaining, or both, please do whatever it is you see fit to show that. And among the things you can is by supporting the channel on patreon.com slash Genesis. The incredible people on screen now, including Wasteland Legends fan, have been supporting the channel and keeping the thing running. And they also get the benefits of seeing some B-roll stuff, my face in monthly updates, and other interesting things over on the Patreon. So please go check it out if you're interested. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Kato Genesis, and may you wander Night City like you own it.